to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is George Lockett from International Geothermal Energy Consultancy. In 1982, George was appointed a director of Total Energy Conservation and Management of the Limited and of Energy <coughs> Soft Computer Systems Limited. The work consisted mainly of carrying out energy efficiency surveys as a registered consultant on the government's energy efficiency survey scheme. This involves surveying a diversity of manufacturing processes, such as brick, slab, steel, bread, and paper production, and many other small manufacturing processes, with a high energy requirement for heating, refrigeration, and drying. George was a registered consultant with the British Consultants Bureau and the World Bank. He co-invented and patented the single four-hole geothermal energy extraction system for extracting heat from the Earth's crust to generate electrical power. George has presented papers, attended exhibitions, and traveled with government ministers to Japan, the USA, Greece, Germany, and Portugal, representing British industry and British overseas. So good morning. Um, the talk today is going to be on the geothermal potential of the North Sea oil and gas industry. Um, I'll start by just putting the hydrocarbon industries into context. And all the oil, coal, and gas that we're using today comes out of the Earth's crust, and the crust itself only makes up 0.4% of the total mass of the planet. The other remaining 99.6% is hot from 500 degrees, going up to 5,000 degrees C in the center. So, geothermal is a huge resource that's totally renewable. It, uh, there's you could almost say like a, like a nuclear reaction in the center of the planet generating the heat energy, but it, it's generating it not through a nuclear reaction, it's generated through high pressure. Um, so it's, uh, it's, the other thing that people may not realize is, is, is that as we move offshore, the Earth's crust gets thinner, which is the reason why I'm suggesting geothermal in the, the North Sea oil and gas industry. Um, the thickness of the Earth's crust on land is uh, between about 40 and 70 kilometers, with 40 on the coastal plains and 70 under the mountain ranges. The, you know, if you can imagine the mountains like ice, uh, the higher they go up, the deeper they go down into the ground. But as you move onto the continental shelf, the Earth's crust itself becomes very thin. And uh, just to give you an idea of some of the distances here, we're talking. Um, about 200 nautical miles offshore, between 200 and 300, the Earth's crust drops <coughs> down to even thinner as you come towards the edges of the tectonic plates. So um, the oil and gas industry is, is ideally situated in that respect. If we look at some of the, the established fields in the North Sea, we can see that there is uh, 230 oil fields, 100 gas fields. There's already been drilled 2,900 oil wells and 1,200 gas wells. Um, a lot of these are coming to the end of their useful life. And so it would make sense to start now to look at finding alternate uses for the structure in the North Sea. I mean, in terms of decommissioning the structures in the UK part of the North Sea, there's 450 structures. Um, some of the concrete structures have a, a useful life of about 400, uh, sorry, 300 years, uh, a maintenance-free life. So um, at the moment, they've only been used between 30 to 50 years, about 300 years. So, um, it would make sense to find an alternate use for them rather than decommissioning them. Um, the budget for decommissioning these 450 structures has been set at 30 billion pounds. So for this huge amount of money that's been set aside for, for the taking down of the rigs, you, you know, if we can find an alternate use for them and uh, extend the life of, of these 
structures for, um, <coughs> I'm, I'm going to say 30 years. The reason why I'm saying 30 years is that the, the life of the plant that you put on them to generate the geothermal will last 30 years <laughs> and then it will need upgrading to a new plant. So um, even though you know the, the, the structures will last 300 years, uh, um, the reason why I'm saying 30 is it's because um, you know you'll have to recommission them and uh, and, and to fit new generators again every 30 years. But, but no, there's nothing to stop you doing that. I mean the the geothermal resource will keep replenishing itself. It's not as though you're going to run out of the geothermal heat. It's, uh, that, will, that will keep um, uh, replenishing itself. So why not see rigs? Um, it's uh, um, I mean. Uh, normally, in uh, one of the main geothermal systems that is, is uh, talked about in the UK is, is EGS, Enhanced Geothermal Systems. Um, they used to be hot dry rock schemes, and, and what, what they basically are is have um, one or two wells, you're injecting water down one well, and you're basically getting hot water out of another. I mean, the use of the North Sea rigs is that there's quite often 20 wells drilled from each platform, uh, especially if it's a non non movable one like a concrete structure. So, um, because there are so many wells, um, you, uh, it may be that you're in an oil field that becomes very marginal, that some wells are being shut in um, with the intention, you know, the price of oil goes up. Well, reopen these wells and start extracting the oil again. I mean, one thing that we will be talking about later on as we move through the presentation is enhanced soil recovery. I mean, I'm talking today about three main forms of geothermal. I'll just give a brief overview of that. Um, you've got basically the geothermal heat bringing it to the surface generator and the electricity. But the enhanced soil recovery where you drill deeper you get higher temperatures, you then bring it to the surface, generate the electricity, and then re-inject the steam into the oil fields and uh, dissolve the heavy cars and, and uh, extract geothermal energy that way. And then another system I'll be talking about is, is that of using uh, the gas pressure to generate um, energy. I mean, a lot of the high temperature, high temperature fields high temperature, high pressure fields have got uh, pressures in excess of, in the UK, about 1,500 pounds per square inch. So, um, you know, that pressure can be used uh, to generate energy as well, that mechanical pressure. We'll, we'll go into that as we go through the presentation. So, uh, an example of uh, the potential of, of a geothermal <coughs> rig. Uh, this particular one, uh, the at skin platform. Um, so basically, it's uh, 1,400 pounds, sorry, 14,000 pounds per inch, uh, at 175 degrees centigrade. So we'll, we'll move on a little bit further. Um, another field, which again is, is east of. Aberdeen. I've particularly chosen these because they're fairly close to Aberdeen. So we're talking about a, 150 miles east of Aberdeen here. But um, basically, um, these are slightly higher pressures than the, and temperatures than the first example. Um, I, I don't know if you want me to read the figures or not, but uh, you can see them on the chart here. Um, you're talking very high pressures. You're talking, uh, you, you know, the, the oil is actually coming out of the ground at, at uh, you know, nearly 200 degrees centigrade in the, the lower of the two examples <coughs> that I'm showing here. And, and this heat, if it's, if it's put through a shallow tube heat exchanger as it comes up to the surface, it, you know, you can use the oil as the working fluid and, uh, you know, put it through a heat exchanger and, it, and extract the the geothermal power uh, into our steam system or into an organic ground tank system using a, a uh, refrigerant fluid as a working fluid. 
Um, another advantage of the North Sea is, uh, you know, on land, when you talk about cooling towers, um, the, they talk in terms, you, you, you know, the mixture of air and water is, is they give the, uh, the term wet bulb temperature. On land, we can only cool the, the, um, the condensate fluid down to about 27 degrees centigrade. But the beauty of the North Sea is that you've got infinite supplies of cold seawater at 5 degrees centigrade. So, um, by, you know, you are using refrigerant fluid, the, uh, the lower you can condense that, the lower the temperature gives you a, a much greater range across the, the turbines for actually extracting the, the, the useful power and improving the efficiency of the whole system. So, um, the, the condensate side of the cycle is also very, very important. So, um, we'll talk a, a little about some of the turbines that I'm suggesting using for this. This particular one was entered for this Edison Award in April. It's a, a natural gas letdown generator. <coughs> and what that basically means is that it's taking gas pressure, it's running it through a, a compressor in reverse, which is basically making it it's an expander. I mean, uh, if you go through some of the technical um, diagrams here, <coughs> uh, you can see the compressor on this particular slide. Um, it's actually a, a, twin, a twin screw um, expander, and uh, you know the pressure of, of the working fluid moves through it and expands, but it also reduces the pressure. These, these can be used uh, throughout, uh, throughout the UK on land as well. You know, if you've got a, a gas main, uh, the, 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 uh, the main connectors between towns, if you like, could be at very high pressure, but when they come to where it's going to be used locally, you basically reduce the pressure down to a suitable pressure for they're being used in, in domestic houses and in industry. Um, this particular um, letdown generator can be used in place of just reduction valves. Um, you know, it's still doing the same job, it's reducing the pressure, but at the same time it is also uh, generating energy that can be used uh, put into the national grid and things like that. So, um, quite interesting. I mean, these are just, just, just give you an idea of the, uh, the the different power outputs at different temperatures. And uh, you've got temperature on the bottom and the, the number of kilowatt generated. And um, obviously the higher the temperature, the more power you're getting out. This particular example shows about four mega uh, what you know, four megawatts of power at about 100 and 160 degrees centigrade. Um, but, uh, you, you know, larger systems are being considered. I mean, they're, they're looking at, there was one example of this twin screw being used that could be 20 me megabytes, and obviously you can bank the engineers kind of five in a row, producing a giga, uh, you know, gigawatts of power. So, um, as I say, I, I, the, the, the website, uh, so sorry, the, the presentation will be put on the the All Energy website after the event, so people that want to go into the details of these charts can, can look at them online afterwards. So again, it's just talking about efficiency, so we won't uh, go into that too much at this stage. Um, this is a, another alternate generator, I mean, uh, this is an organic Rankine cycle generator. Um, they, they, it's evolved a little bit in that it used to be made by Pratt and Whitney in the, in the United States, so they produced quite a nice, neat, small unit that produced 250 kilowatts of power. This, this particular turbogen, turbogen has been taken over by the parent company of uh, Pratt and Whitney as well. The Pratt and, the Pratt and Whitney uh, smaller system is no longer available. This one is a, a three megawatt unit, plus, yeah, three megawatts, but it can, that they do do it up to 12 megawatts uh, 
in a unit and uh, again you can see the, the temperature ranges that, that each one operates in uh, <coughs> the typical one again is around about the, uh, the 160 I thought I had the temperature range up on each slide but I seem to have missed it from this one but I think it's again it's about 160 degrees centigrade the operating temperature um, a much lower temperature system, which could be used more widely throughout the North Sea, is uh, the system by Deleuze. Um, this is using uh, CO2 as the working fluid, and uh, as you can see, it, it's, uh, its temperature range is uh, 82 degrees centigrade or 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but for this system to work, they need about 100 degrees Fahrenheit temperature difference between the input and the output. But with the cold seawater at 5 degrees, there's no problem getting down to about 80 degrees Fahrenheit for the condensate part of the cycle. So that this deluge system could work, operate at very low temperatures in the North Sea and could generate quite large amounts of, uh, of electrical power. Um, another <coughs> generation system was the single bottle system that I, I did own the patents on it back in the 1980s. Uh, the patents have now run out. But um, what, what the system did, it combined two cycles the heat pipe cycle and the organic run time, time cycle together. Uh, the heat pipe is just a system for transferring heat in a passive way. It doesn't involve any pumping over fairly long distances. I mean, the, the, uh, the fluids tra travel up the pipe at, at the atomic velocity, and uh, uh, you, 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 with, with a small return pump, you can re inject air. Now, on the bottom kilometre, you, you have like a simple wick that allows a thin film of a working fluid to be spread around the, the lowest kilometre. Uh, this particular system only works in hydrothermal fields, so we're talking of either a field that's got a lot of hot water in it or a lot of oil or, or steam. Uh, but, but basically, what, what you're doing with this particular design is, is using the air for the downhill heat exchanger. This, is, this comes in where there's a, a lot of pollutants in the geothermal fluid. You know, if you allow the fluids to come up to the surface and flash off, then quite often they leave the suspended solids in the well, and very soon the, the well closes up with the suspended solids. So by using this downhill heat exchange system, you maintain the, the pressure in the field. You don't allow the the work, the, uh, the polluted fluid in the field to flash off. Um, so that, you, you know, just through natural convection currents, you know, the influence of the moon, you get shifts in the in the uh, liquids even even below ground, and uh, you know it forms basically an outhouse heat exchange. So this is another quite interesting system. Um, and uh, again, the last the last okay, the the, the last uh, turbo design that I'm going to mention is the cleaner cycle. This this uses uh, quite an interesting combination of ammonia and water as a working fluid. The efficiency of this cycle is about 50% more than the uh, than a standard or organic rankine cycle. I, uh, I think I mentioned on this one uh, the, the uh, company G uh, Global Geothermal. It's just been taken over for, by another company called Watanabe in the last uh, few, few minutes. And, um, Another major area we're going to be talking about is uh, secondary oil recovery. I mean, the, the limits of, uh, of current drilling, and uh, then move on to the next slide, is uh, you know, Baker Hughes here is currently designing drill bits that can operate up to 300 degrees centigrade and other logging equipment that operates at the same temperature. Um, so, you, you know, the, the current trim, drilling limit is about 10,000 meters. And uh, this, this uh, on the 1st of May, this, this new platform contract was, uh, was given out. Again, designed to drill down 10,000 10, meters. So, the technology is now getting in place to, to reach these uh, temperatures of 300 degrees centigrade in the North Sea 
you can bring that temperature up to the surface and generate the electric power and, uh, and then re-inject it and uh, use it for steam flooding the fields and, and getting secondary oil recovery. Uh, this particular slide wants to do with the electricity that's produced. Um, I'm listing a few options here. It can be used locally on the rig. Uh, you can transmit it back to the shore by laying submersible cables. Um, you can generate hydrogen through electrolysis on the platforms and then use hydrogen as a fuel. Or you, you can basically work with the wind industry that's building offshore wind and use the wind in industry's um, cables and, and basically smooth, smooth out. Uh, some of the peaks and troughs that you get with, with wind production. So, um, I'm sorry I've had to run the rush through the presentation today, but the, uh, um, you, you know, that gives you an idea. There's a couple of press releases that I've got copies on, on my desk. One of them was in Trillium Review, which is just um, one that came out in this, this week's Sunday Times. One of the two remains on. Uh, I have to say this is a it's a, an area that's always impressed me. Again, working in the young geologist offshore, I remember being very impressed with the, the temperatures we can come through, particularly in the southern North Sea. I remember where we had uh, thick seas of salt and the the mud temperatures that came back to the surface were, were quite staggering. Uh, so, do you have any questions for George? Any questions from the floor? Uh, yes, yes, indeed. There's, uh, uh, especially in the last uh, six months or so, there's been quite a lot of correspondence going back to the floor. I also were. Uh, with a company in Texas as well called Geotech, and uh, and 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 that uh, you know, I'm also doing a lot a lot out in America as well in terms of uh, de developing converting the the Texas oil wells into geothermal power power stations as well. So um, I, uh, I I can see with, with, within the, you know especially with the recent press releases. Um, the, uh, the, the way I see it developing, first of all, is, is uh, probably more on secondary oil recovery because um, that, that uh, you know, with crude oil being at such a high price at the moment, it can possibly could even, even double in the next six months and you go up to two hundred dollars a barrel. Um, the, the, the the marginal fields in the North Sea. Uh, I mean that the, the reserve of heavy coal that you can bring up to to steam flooding the field uh, is twice that of conventional oil. So there's a huge resource still available in the North Sea that that, that if, if the geothermal industry works with the oil industry then then then, then, then maybe the, 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 the oil and gas could 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 still be Generated from the North Sea for the next 30, 100 years. Um, so, how is your question? Could you use the microphone? Mm -hmm. um, uh, what sort of remediation costs are you talking about in converting the North Sea? The remediation costs afterwards. Well, well it'll be very similar. Uh, as, as we're using the same structure uh, as was used in the oil industry. You know, the downhill fracturing, the, uh, the wells are already drilled by the oil industry. You know, if you can just use their, their um, structures, then, then all we're doing is putting off the decommissioning for another 30 years. And, you, you know, the system can be extended for a further year period after that, then it gets put off for another 30, 30 years. And, uh, the, 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 the point being is, is, is that the, the bond, I think, has already already been paid by the oil companies to the government for all the decommissioning of the structures. And, uh, you know, that bond will probably still stay in place and, and uh, you know, will still apply to that structure. And, uh, you, you know, obviously inflation is such that the cost will go up. But if the money is properly invested, the, 
the Bowery with that. Um, Bob and Shaw also kill up at the Bowery with that. I'm sure that. Michael Ruggio from Shell. Um, just I think further to that, um, is it, do you use the same wells or do you just use the infrastructure and then you drill separate wells for geothermal? Um, for, for secondary oil recovery, I'm suggesting that, that you drill deeper. I mean, one of the advantages of this drilling deeper is that you may actually find another oil field beneath the current one. Uh, uh, I mean, this is happening a lot in Louisiana <coughs> at the moment. I mean, most oil wells in Louisiana are only drilled below um, 10,000 feet, basically, but, you know, but uh, 3,000 meters. Um, in, in the last uh, 12 months, they've been going, you know, they've started going a lot deeper, and, and they've actually found uh, two more levels of sand beneath. Well, well, what have been the traditional oil fields and where they're getting much high pressure temperature um, oil reserves that are, are actually easier for them to, to get out of the ground because of the pressures in the field and the only reason they found that is by drilling deeper and the same thing could happen in the North Sea uh, there could still be reserves beneath the current oil fields that we're not aware of yet until someone actually drills down and finds them and one you know, one reason to drill is to get the geothermal energy. <laughs> but, but, it, but you know, while you're drilling, if you do find another oil field, then probably that, that they will want to extract the oil first <coughs> for the geothermal system. But there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks, George. I think we keep uh, we keep questions until the end. I think we're out of time at the end of the quarter. Thanks very much, George. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker.